Established in 1902 by the promised Messiah, alayhi salam, the Review of Religions is one of the longest-running magazines on comparative religious thought. Over the course of a century, it has been presenting the true teachings of Islam to the world and has served as a powerful defense against all attacks. The Review of Religions, an exclusive look into the magazine and the timely articles of the promised Messiah, alayhi salam, that ushered in the unprecedented era of Islam's rise in the West. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Welcome viewers to the second program of the Review of Religions, where we bring to you the summary of the articles written by the Prophet Sallallahu in the Review of Religions magazine. In this episode, we will be discussing the February 1902 issue, which discusses the topic of unity versus trinity. In this article, Promise Messiah explains the concept of Trinity, which is upheld by the Christians. To help me with this program today, I'm joined by Umar Akbar Sahib, who is the missionary for Brampton region, and Hanan Sobi Sahib, who is serving as the missionary for Hamilton region. Also, via Skype from London, England, we are joined by Amir Safir Sahib, who is uh, serving as the chief editor for the Review of Religions magazine. Assalamu alaikum, gentlemen. Wa alaikum as wa barakatuh. So before we get into the summary of the article, I would like to request Amir Safir Sahib, please tell us what was the prime mission of the Promised Messiah alayhi salam? In essence, the message of the Promised Messiah and his objective was no different to all the prophets and messengers who came before, because the Promised Messiah alayhi salam was also a prophet of God. All the prophets who came before came with a similar purpose, to reform mankind, to reconnect them with God the Almighty, and to teach them to live in peace and love with one another. The only difference here is the Promised Messiah's mission was intertwined with the mission of the Holy Prophet And all the Prophets who came before the Holy Prophet came for only a specific group of people in a limited area and vicinity. So with the Holy Prophet ﷺ, the message was perfected, the message of God. And that was in the shape of the Holy Qur'an, which was the final Sharia, or the law of God, which was destined to be established until the end of time. And that was for all peoples, for all faiths and people of no faith even. So the Promised Messiah's mission was to revive this message. Now if we say that the Promised Messiah's message was intertwined with the Holy Prophet ﷺ, we have to look then to that Sharia that he brought, the Holy Qur'an, and to the words of the Holy Prophet ﷺ, which can explain to us what the objective of the Messiah is. For this, we look to Surah Juma, which is chapter 62 of the Holy Qur'an, verses 3 and 4. And here we find an explanation of what the coming Messiah, his purpose would be. So the translation of this verse reads that he it is who raised among the unlettered people a messenger from among themselves who recites unto them his signs and purifies them and teaches them the book and the wisdom although they were before in manifest misguidance. And among others from among them who had not yet joined them, he is the mighty, the wise. Now in particular, this latter verse in the commentary of the Holy Quran, Tafsir Kabir, it is explained that this latter part of the verse, and among others from among them who have not yet joined them, refers to a famous tradition of the Holy Prophet wasallam, which relates to the second spiritual advent of the Holy Prophet wasallam. And in this hadith, in this tradition, Hadith Abu Huraira relates that we were sitting among the company of the Holy Prophet wasallam when this surah, Surah Juma, was revealed. And I asked the Holy Prophet, says Abu Huraira, that what does this part of the chapter mean, that and among others from among them who have not yet joined them. At that time, Hazrat Salman Farzi, Salman the Persian, may Allah be pleased with him, was sitting in that gathering. And upon repeated asking of the Holy Prophet wasallam, he finally answered by putting his hand on Hazrat Salman the Persian and said, if the faith ascended to the Pleiades, someone from among them, from someone from among these, indicating towards Hadrat Salman the Persian, would restore that faith. So we also know in another tradition of the Holy Prophet Wasallam, he said that there would be a time when Islam would remain only in its name. There would be the Holy Quran, but only its words would remain. It would not really be followed. The mosques would be full, but be, would be devoid of guidance. And he said the scholars, the Muslim scholars, the ulama of the time would be the worst of the people. They would be issuing strife. So the coming of the Promised Messiah salam, would be linked with the mission of reviving that faith. And the Promised Messiah being 
of Persian origin, Persian descent. This was this link with what the Holy Prophet ﷺ indicated, that it would be someone of Persian origin. So, in essence, the Promised Messiah did not come to bring anything new. He came to revive the mission of the Holy Prophet ﷺ, which the Holy Prophet ﷺ himself had indicated a time would come when the Muslims would forget their faith and would be paying lip service to the religion. Uh, but as mentioned, the Holy Prophet ﷺ brought a universal message. It was not exclusive to the Muslims. Islam was supposed to be a religion which would bring people of all faiths under the banner of that final Prophet. Whether they're Christians, Jews, Hindus, Sikhs, people, people of no faith even, they were all invited to come under that final message. So similarly, the Promised Messiah's message was for all people. And his essential aim was to connect people back to God the Almighty. And he has mentioned in numerous places why he had come and how he would connect people back to God. So for example, in lecture Lahore, one of the books of the Promised Messiah, he mentions that the task for which God has appointed me is that I should remove the distance and impurity that afflicts the relationship between God and his creatures, and I should restore the relationship of love and sincerity with them. In another book of the Promised Messiah salam, called Tariyak al the Promised Messiah mentions that God has sent me to the world so that through gentleness, love and kindness, I should draw towards God and His holy guidance people who have gone astray and should enable them to tread the right path with the divine light which has been bestowed upon me. Man stands in need of such reasoning as would convince him that God does it indeed exist insomuch as much of the world is being led to ruin for lack of faith in the existence of God. The Promised Messiah salam, essentially therefore came to reconnect man with God and he did this by proving that do not look at these religions which speak of signs and revelations and miracles of the past, these religions which are based on antiquity. Instead the Promised Messiah salam, proved that God speaks today as he always has. The door of revelation is open today as it has been since time immemorial and God speaks to his servants today if only they take a step towards him. And the Promised Messiah essentially spoke of two things in connection with God. One was Hakukullah and the other was Hakukul Ibad. Hakukullah meaning the rights of God and the other being the rights of people. And this was one of the fundamental objectives as explained by the Promised Messiah, that he would show people how to reach God, how their prayers could be accepted, how they could communicate with God even today. And secondly, in terms of the rights of mankind, to show that all people regardless of race, color, etc., should live in peace and love with one another. One of the second main aims of the Promised Messiah salam, related to the dissemination of the message, and this was called the takmile ishat -e din the fulfillment of the propagation of this perfect message. Now, there are two eras in Islam that were described by the Promised Messiah salam. One was the era of the Holy Prophet ﷺ. He brought with him, as was mentioned, the perfect message and the final law-bearing message in the shape of the Holy Quran and in the shape of Islam. But at the time of the Holy Prophet ﷺ, although Islam did spread to distant lands in his life and directly after him, it was impossible for it to spread all over the world because the technology did not exist. The means of communication were not available. This is why it was destined both by the Holy Prophet wasallam in his various traditions, for example, where he foretells the modern modes of transport when he describes the Dajjal. Similarly, there are countless other places, for example, in Surah at takbir of the Holy Quran, which speaks of the latter days and the new means that would become available. So that time of the Promised Messiah would be the time of the takmile ishat din the fulfillment of the propagation of the message. So just before the time of the Promised Messiah, the Industrial Revolution took place and you had inventions such as electricity, steam power, the printing press, mass communication come into being. Everything was in place for this final message of God, Islam, to be disseminated. And this was one of the main aims of the Promised Messiah to, to spread this message widely. And the review of religions was one such mean out of many means that he formed to spread this message in particular to the West and to fulfill that objective of using all those modern means that God Almighty had provided to spread the message all over the world in what is today a global village where information can be spread at the click of a button. So this was also one of the main aims of the Promised Messiah Salam's advent.
Thank you, Amir Sahib, for uh, this very succinct uh, explanation of his uh, accomplishment through the review of religions. I recall one of the quotes by the Prophet Muhammad Islam, which uh, he writes that uh, all these modern inventions, the um, old um, people of the olden style thinking of the Mulvis I'm talking about, which uh, Prophet Muhammad Islam says that they wither, they shiver away from the thought of the n modern inventions. So, Prophet Muhammad Islam really said to use these uh, modern inventions for the uh, ishaat e deen for the propagation of Islam. Viewers, we will be discussing today the article that uh, deals with the unity versus trinity. Promise Messiah Islam uh, addressing the missionaries who were really widely propagating Christian religion at the time and the doctrine of trinity. He refuted those arguments. Anand Sahib, in regards to that, uh, according to the Christian missionaries of the time, what is the salvation of uh, humanity dependent upon? So according to the Christian missionaries, the salvation of humanity depends on uh, two, uh, their two core beliefs. The first is the belief of the Christians in the concept of Trinity. The concept of Trinity is that there is God the Father, God the Son, and God of the Holy Spirit. And these are three separate yet coexisting gods. Their second belief is that of atonement. And what atonement is, is that Jesus Christ, peace be upon Him, they believe that He died for the, the sins of mankind. Or in other words, Jesus Christ, peace be upon Him, He became a curse so that the sinners of the world could be saved from the, the punishment. And in regards to this, the Promised Messiah wasalam, in this article, Unity versus Trinity, He states that it is with great regret that we have to say that both these dogmas are dead against the laws of nature. They are repugnant to the nature of man, unsupported by the holy books of God, uncorroborated by any living and conclusive proofs and rejected by the opinion of the majority of those who have inherited the revealed books. So in this article, the Promised Messiah Islam, he mentions these points to disprove the concept of the Trinity. Azur goes in fact on to rebuke these arguments against the Trinity and atonement by mentioning uh, through logical and uh, very academic arguments. In fact, the first one that he mentions, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Umar Sahib, how does divine law reject the concept of Trinity? The Prophet Sallallahu Islam explains that the divine laws, that being the laws of nature, are dead against Trinity. And he examines all of these uh, natural, naturally occurring phenomena and he compares them. What do they lean towards? What do they prove? He says if you take the earth, for example, or all the cosmological bodies, the sun, the moon, the stars, they're all spherical in nature. And even if you look at a small scale, if you look at a drop of water, it's also round. And in fact, all of the elements, they demonstrate a rotundity in shape. And he writes, Ramza explains, that the handiwork of a three-cornered god ought to have been three-sided like its maker. So here again, he, ex he explains that if Trinity, if the doctrine of Trinity was true, we would find examples of it in nature. We don't find these things to be triangular. Again, we find them to be spherical. So this is the first proof that the Prophet Islam explains. So in fact, uh, there are no proofs in the laws of nature which can support Trinity. Hanan Sahib, in regards to the human nature, does uh, human nature support, uh, as Prophet Sallallahu Islam explains, uh, the concept of Trinity? So even human nature completely rejects the concept of Trinity, and on the contrary, it supports the belief in the unity of God. And the Promised Messiah Sallallahu Islam, in his article, he's written that even if you take idolaters, for example, they have made thousands of gods for themselves, and yet those gods are actually just the intercessors for the one true God. And at that time, the Christian theologians, the Promised Messiah Sallallahu Islam, has named one infamous Reverend Fander. He even professed that the concept of Trinity is not inherently known to man, meaning that if it's not taught to the people, if Trinity is not taught to the people, they would be completely unaware of it. And the Promised Messiah Islam, has argued that this shows that the Creator has impressed the belief of the unity of God onto His creation. And the Promised Messiah Islam, states that how can we account for this except that human nature, bearing as it did very strong impressions of the unity of its Creator, could never rest contented with the plurality of gods, but was compelled from within to acknowledge above them all the one true God. 
Now, so far we have seen that the divine, through the divine law, uh, the world itself does not support Trinity. And we have seen that the nature of man itself does not support this concept of Trinity. We must uh, also see that the promised Messiah Islam has refuted this argument another way, in a third way, which is that how does it, uh, how do the prophets uh, explain this? So Umar Sahib, tell us, does the Bible support uh, this concept of Trinity? Okay. So the promised Messiah Islam while speaking about this point, he says that if you look at the Old Testament, specifically in the whole Bible, you'll find that there's so much stress laid on the unity of God and not in Trinity. In fact, if you look at all the books from Genesis to Malachi, there's no mention whatsoever uh, of Trinity and they all are adamant about the unity of God. Just to give a couple examples before us, for the viewers, if we look at Exodus chapter 34, verse 14, it states, for thou shalt worship no other God for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. And Isaiah chapter 44, verse 6, This is what the Lord says, Israel's King and Redeemer, the Lord Almighty. I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me, there is no other God. So again, even if we look at the teachings of the New Testament, even if they are altered and all of these things, even there, there is no stress laid upon uh, the Trinity. And in fact, the Promise of Islam has said if you weigh all of these, if you actually went out and weighed uh, in one hand uh, the arguments for unity versus the arguments of Trinity, you would find no arguments whatsoever for Trinity. And he writes, if anyone can show that the same stress is laid upon Trinity as upon unity in the revealed Word of God, I would be the first to recant my principles and accept the opposite doctrine. So again, if the Prophet ﷺ explains that if you would weigh these arguments in favor of unity versus those of Trinity, there is no comparison whatsoever. And the revealed word is so, um, so staunch in this regard that it's firmly uh, proclaiming the unity of God. If the uh, Christians can uh, base their assertions in the deity of uh, Jesus Christ on such vague assertions, then Hindus, who are also the people of the book, can also base their uh, assertions on Krishna and uh, Rama as the uh, deity as well. In, in regards to the majority of the people of book, Hanansa, what do the people of the book, uh, how do they reject this notion of Trinity? So the Jews, they were the first heirs to the Bible and they, they have no concept of Trinity in their teachings. The, the prophet Moses, peace be upon him, he was the prophet who came to them, he gave them their teachings. And he not only gave them their teachings, but he also commentated on the teachings, what their actual beliefs are. And in, throughout the books of the prophet Moses, peace be upon him, he professed the belief in the unity of God Almighty. The biblical teachings are so clear in emphasizing the unity of God, and the Jews were commanded that they should remember this uh, teaching of God by heart they should bind it upon their doors and they should abide by it at all times. And not only that, they were also warned that if they'd go away from this teaching of believing in the one God, then they would be utterly destroyed from the face of the earth. Christians, uh, in fact, were not the only recipient of this message. Um, Jews were the first recipient of this message. Uh, Umar Sahib, what do the Promised Messiah Islam say in regards to the concept of unity as far as the people of the book or the series of the prophets from these people of the book are concerned? You know, if we look at how God was so adamant, and as we already mentioned that He was a jealous God, He's so adamant about upholding this concept of unity. And it was the most important principle for all religions, and specifically we find here um, in the people of the book. And we find that for 1400 years, He continuously sent prophets in the house of Israel, continuously, time after time, and they would so, so adamantly state again that there's only one God and state the unity of God. So this, through this we find that, you know, there's either two things that could have happened. That either the Christians are right and the prophets did not fulfill their mission of telling the people what true salvation was. And we find that it's definitely not the case and the prophets continuously told them what true salvation depends upon. And that was to accept the unity of God and not these concepts of Trinity or um, the dogmas of atonement. So we find that the, the Promise of Islam, again, he pays, uh, great, uh, pays great stress, uh, lays great stress upon this, on this point, that if we look at these scriptures and what the prophets taught, you would not find 
any stress on Trinity. And I will quote from the Prophet's writings. So nothing is more surprising than that the Jews should have remained so ignorant of the doctrines of Trinity and atonement, although upon them alone depended their salvation. In vain did the prophets preach, and in vain were their lives spent, if they did not even communicate to the people the true doctrine of salvation, and thus utterly failed to fulfill the object for which they had been raised by God. So here again, the promise Prophet ﷺ explains that if these, the reason for these prophets was to lead them, lead the people to God, it's quite alarming that they would not even have mentioned these uh, fundamental doctrines according to the Christians of Trinity and Atonement. And again, the Prophet um, elaborates that we find that even all of the Christians are not unanimous on this assertion and this du uh, dubious uh, doctrine. And we find certain sects who do not profess Trinity. And in fact, they are also believing in the unity of God. So this shows that there is not really any base found in the revealed Word of God, the scriptures um, of the people of the book that pay any stress on Trinity. So viewers, uh, here we have seen that Prophet Sallallahu Islam is saying that there's not even a unanimity in terms of the Christians themselves. Even today we have sects that do not believe in this uh, notion of Trinity. Now in regards to the uh, testimony that uh, even Quran presents as far as the people of the cave are concerned, that shows that uh, this unity versus Trinity concept was not there amongst all the Christians throughout the time. Now having revealed through the uh, different points the doctrine of Trinity, the Promised Messiah went on to disprove this notion of atonement as well and how it ties to the concept of the divinity of Jesus and he also explains how his birth does not support this argument at all. In regards to that uh, concept, uh, as explained by the Promised Messiah Islam, Hanansab, tell us how does the virgin birth uh, does not uh, denote the divinity of Jesus Christ Islam? So in this article, the Promised Messiah Islam, he's very clearly written that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was an ordinary human being. And the Christian uh, missionaries, the theologians, they try to elevate the rank of the, the Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, by saying that because he was born without a father, therefore he has this special quality that he is a deity and he is the son of God or he, or he is God. But the Promised Messiah, والسلام, he has argued that it's true that it was a miraculous birth, it was an extraordinary birth, but this isn't something that denotes divinity. So he gave the example of the first human being, the progenitor of humanity. He was born without a mother or a father. So are we to then take him to be a god as well? Similarly, in the animal kingdom, we find or it is observed that there's insects which are born without the aid of any male. So then are they also, if we take the, the teachings of the Christians or this argument that they present to show the, uh, that the Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was a god. So then would these insects also be sons of God or, or gods? So yes, it was, it's reported in history. It was somewhat of a medical marvel but it's nothing that denotes the divinity of Jesus, peace be upon him. Viewers, it's such an injustice on the part of the Christians to say that uh, Jesus Christ, Islam, from such vague assertions that are in the Bible, to say that he was a son of God and take him as a deity. The Bible uses these terms as metaphorical, and we should not take them to mean that Jesus Christ, Islam, was son of God. Now, in regards to that, uh, Umar Sahib, tell us what is the real meaning of son of God in, uh, in the Bible? You know, Jesus Islam, has been called the Son of God and he has used, him, used it for himself in the Bible, of course. But we should not misconstrue this from the real meanings of this metaphor. If we look at the Old Testament, it's replete with such metaphorical expressions. We find many examples of speaking of sons of God or even daughters of God. And in one place, the Prophet Islam writes that he even mentions that we are all gods. Uh, just for the sake of the viewers, I'll quote one example that the Prophet ﷺ explained. He mentioned that in Exodus chapter 4, verse 22, uh, so while speaking about Jacob ﷺ, it says, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. So here we find a clear example where someone is called the son of God, in fact, the firstborn. We find other examples where all of the Israelites are called the children of God. Even if we look to, towards the Gospels, we find that Adam is called the son of God over and over again. So these metaphors should be understood as such. 
that they give a different meaning. They're not actually um, true statements which are factual statements, but they're metaphorical expressions of love from God the Almighty. So it's quite unfortunate that uh, the Christians have misconstrued these, these words from their true intent. So we were, Bible uh, uses these terms for Jesus Christ Islam, um, but does not mean that he is son of God. At the same time, Quran um, as well mentions uh, Holy Prophet Sallallahu in far higher regard. And, uh, you know, Muslims could have also said that uh, this could mean that he's also a uh, son of God, but God forbid, they didn't. How, Anansab, tell us, how does the Quran explain in far greater, um, you know, expressions for Holy Prophet Sallallahu uh, So if uh, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, has been referred to as son of God, and this is a metaphorical expression mentioned in the Bible, and they take it to mean that he is the literal son of God, then we, a Muslim, he could argue that in the Holy Quran, even greater expressions than the Son of God have been used for the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Promised Messiah wasalam, in this article, he mentioned a few verses. For example, verse number, or Surah number 48, verse number 11, where Allah says, Inna lazina yubayyunaka, inna ma yubayyun allaha yadullahi foka aidihim. Where Allah says, Verily those who swear allegiance to thee, indeed they swear allegiance to Allah, and the hand of Allah is over their hands. So here Allah Ta'ala is saying that when companions pledged allegiance to the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah is saying that it was my hand over the hand of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Similarly, in another verse of the Holy Quran, the Promised Messiah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has stated uh, in verse number, Surah number 39, verse 54, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَتُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الزنوبة جَمِيعًا Let's say, O oh my servants who have committed excesses against their own souls, despair not of thy mercy of Allah. Surely Allah forgives all sins. So the Promised Messiah والسلام, he stated that these are just examples, some examples from the Holy Quran from which a Muslim could deduce that the Holy Prophet وسلم, is a, a greater than, and, than a man and is, is at the level of a deity. But these are just metaphors and they're understood as metaphors. Whereas the same examples which are mentioned in the Bible are not even as solid as the ones mentioned for the Holy Prophet ﷺ in the Holy Quran. We were studying the writings of the Promised Messiah ﷺ. It shows that uh, he never let go of any opportunity to show that the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ was a great prophet and he was far superior than the Jesus Christ ﷺ. In the real light as he has shown the Prophet Sallallahu of the divine can be seen through the character of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. At the same time, the Promised Messiah Islam fulfilled his mission as told, as foretold by the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that when the Messiah comes, he will break the cross and kill the swine. So viewers, uh, this is a whole new topic of another day which we will discuss the status of the Holy Prophet ﷺ. This brings us to the end of the program. I hope you have enjoyed the program and you will take the time to subscribe to the magazine and read the article in its great length to understand it better. This is Maud Tahir from MTA Canada Studios. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.